Well, Paul, we're back. Greg, we are. Isn't it wonderful? This Fantastic. is the Good News for Israel show, and it's uh, it's just great to be with you. Uh, we've got such a an exciting time uh, tonight. You're going to be uh, really blessed by the subject that we've picked tonight to come and just expand on the Word of God. We're actually talking about genealogies. That's a subject you don't often get. I no, certainly don't think I've heard too many uh, conversations <laughs> or preaching about it. On, the, on the genealogy. Uh, of course, we're talking of the genealogy of Jesus, and uh, and it's such an exciting subject when you've got someone like Pastor Paul around, who's uh, you know not only is he uh, you know a, a lay archaeologist and historian, uh, but he just brings the Bible to life. And so we've got lots of questions for you tonight, Paul. So, but today, as usual, let's just start with the scripture, and uh, that scripture is in Genesis chapter twenty-two. It relates to genealogies. And uh, it says there in verse 14, And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your own son, your only son, Blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. Mm. And in your seed, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And in some versions there it says, and your generations or your descendants yes. shall be blessed. And uh, how does this happen? Of course, we're talking about uh, the genealogy of Jesus because um, the Apostle Paul talks about us as sons of Abraham. But we'll we'll talk about that a bit uh, as we're going along. But here's a uh, here's a question, and we've got Anthony's just joined us here. Anthony from North Queensland. Welcome, Anthony. Um, he, uh, it's a lot for those that know Australia. You need a private jet to get up, just about to get up to the North Queensland. But anyway, uh, nice to have you with us, Anthony, and those who are joining around the, uh, the world. Here's a question for you. In the genealogy of Jesus, can you name two women who are in the uh, genealogy of Jesus and what their occupations are? In fact, we'll come back to that towards the end. Yeah. But uh, in the meantime, see if you can you get your Bible knowledge on and, uh, and get back to us and see... see uh, See what, if you can remember who those two women are and their occupation. Well, speaking of women, there's a young young lady that's just joined us there, Greg. Uh, now, Erasima, has she got a, a, another name there, Paul, that you, she goes by? Yeah, I think she's uh, known as Chachi sometimes. Chachi. Yeah, a great fun, to, fun loving woman. <laughs> great to see you, Chachi. Welcome tonight. And she's uh, from Australia as well. Um, now, Paul, uh, I have a question for you. Yes. Do you drive a red Hyundai? <laughs> yeah. No, in fact, but, but I do drive a white one. You drive a white one, absolutely. <laughs> but have you ever noticed that when you've got a car, and it might you, you've never you know you buy a new car or a second-hand car, and it's a you've you've never even known what that car was like before. It's a red Hyundai. You buy one, you never even noticed one ever before. But now, when you're driving your little red Hyundai, so they're, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. That's they're right. everywhere. Absolutely. And that's the same as. The man we're going to be looking at tonight, specifically right. from the genealogy, right. many people may not have heard of this man uh, in, in the Bible, but once you see his name in the Bible and start to look for him as you're reading the scriptures, he's everywhere. Yep. He's absolutely everywhere. And of course, Paul, I'm going to pass over to you and you can tell us a little bit about this amazing person and a bit of your knowledge because you're writing a book on this. Yeah, thanks, Pastor Greg. Um, so those of you who have got your Bibles nearby and you know were prompted by Pastor Greg's question, uh, you'll no doubt be heading to Matthew chapter one and looking at the genealogy of Jesus. So if if uh, if you have, when you look at the genealogy of Jesus, you'll find that there is all of these different descendants, and one of those descendants from the time of uh, Egypt, uh, when they were actually in captivity there, was actually. Uh, a fellow by the name of Narshon. Now, Narshon is one of those people that if I asked you 
who is Nasha on the Bible, I don't think I've ever met anybody who's actually given me an answer, uh, which is which is either aware or has any knowledge of who he actually was. And yet Nashon is one of those people listed in genealogy. And often when you when you hear preaching on genealogy, it's quite light. So they'll often say, you know, there's all these major characters, but then there was people that weren't so well known. And but they don't actually go into them. There's no sort of exploration of who they actually were. So tonight we thought we'd uh, select one of these people and have a look at the life of Nashon. So um, with Nashon, he was a he was actually uh, there in the time of uh, of Moses and Aaron. So he was there when the Egyptians were uh, brutally holding them in slavery. And during that time of slavery, they were submitted to a, a lot of uh, punishment at the end of the day. They were they were being told to, to build all these structures uh, in the city of Ramses and Pithon and, and they were they were having their uh, uh, bricks uh, produced and they were told they no longer could have the straw. So they had to know and go and get the straw stubble to mix with the clay. So Basically, they were winding up the screws and making it harder and harder for them to actually deliver what they were required. So, so they were being oppressed, they were being whipped, and they were they were doing it really, really tough. So, so it came to that point in time where Moses was called, and the Lord called him and said, "Look, I want you to go back." Uh, and he'd left earlier after he killed uh, an Egyptian man for for uh, uh, punishing a um, an Israelite. So he, or a Hebrew, as they call it in the Bible at that time. And so he went away to Midian and, and got married there, and uh, he was called to come back. So when he was called to come back, his brother, Aaron, uh, still actually lived in Egypt at the time. So when Aaron was there, he actually had a brother-in-law by marriage, uh, and that brother-in-law, in fact, was Nashon. So Nashon was actually married into the family of Moses and, and Aaron. So Aaron uh, headed across, and they met uh, Moses halfway, and they... Deliberate, deliberated about uh, coming back and how they're going to do it. So um, when they came back and they and they went through the, the period of time where all the plagues uh, were beset against the Egyptians and were finally released, we find that uh, all of the uh, Israelites were released to, to head off to the Red Sea and they were trapped there. So when they were trapped, um, the Pharaoh changed his mind. They came after him, and the Bible tells us there were 600 chariots that came after him, and all the people started to go into a bit of a panic. So when they were in a bit of a panic, um, Moses uh, basically uh, tried to calm them all down and said, look, it's okay. You know, God's called us to lead you here. Everything will be okay. Basically, just sit tight, and God will take care of things. But God didn't do that at all because God actually requires us to do something when we're faithful. So he actually told Aaron, uh, sorry, told Moses that he was to get up and he was to go, he was to go beside the Red Sea there. And he was actually uh, to lift his rod and command these waters uh, to part. So he was to show his faith in his godly father. And so, and so he did. But at the same time, you know, God did some pretty dramatic things. So he put, a, he put the big uh, cloud at the back of them. There was darkness. So the poor old Egyptians at the back of the chariots, they couldn't see a thing. And at the front of the Israelites, he puts on the arc lights. He, uh, <laughs> he, he ramps up the, the fire. And it's like you imagine you're at a football stadium and, and a pitch black and suddenly all the light, lights go on and it's brilliant white. So here's all the Israelites and they're facing the, this uh, Red Sea and, um, and these lights are suddenly on. So uh, because the tribe of Judah was the, the first tribe uh, that was called, Nashon was actually the leader of the tribe of Judah. So he was the next descendant um, when his father passed away, Aminadab. And so Nashon was actually that leader. So he was responsible for about 247,000 people at that point in time. So it's quite an extraordinary number. So this almost nameless man in the Bible was in command of the largest tribe, the strongest tribe. And in fact, um, he had the, he had the uh, responsibility of also going first in all the endeavours that they were called to. So you can imagine that uh, Moses is standing up on the on the bank of the Red Sea there, and the, the desert's very cold in the Mount Sinai at night time. So, so they're there at dusk, and the and the Egyptians are coming after them. And it says in the third quarter that they entered. So we're talking about three o'clock in the morning that he says, "I want you to go into the water," and it's freezing. So Nashon's uh, basically back, and he said, "Well, you're the leader of the first tribe, so you're going in first, buddy." And so you can imagine him going, who, me? 
you're joking, it's freezing. And, and it's still full, I'm not going in there. And you can see him turn around to all of his tribe and they're looking at him and they go, you're going first, we're not following you unless you go. And he, and he said, no, well, you go. He said, no, you have to go. So he's like, oh, okay, so I have to go first. So he warily treads in and this is where the, the oral Torah, you know, the Bible, uh, we, we know the written Torah is the first five books of the Bible, which we call the Pentateuch. But the Jewish people have the oral Torah and the oral Torah, uh, these writings are, are often called a madrash, so they're the Jewish madrash. And in those writings, it actually specifies that Nashon was, in fact, the first person into the Red Sea. But what he had to do is, unlike the movies where they show Noah lifting up his staff and the water's parting, so that it's actually dry with fish flapping around on the bottom and they walk across, that's not the case. The Jewish people actually said that he had to walk in up to his neck and the water still hadn't parted, and only when he got up to his neck did the water wow. start to part. Wow. So you can imagine this man, he's in up to his neck, nothing's happening, and everyone's watching on going, this isn't happening. But of course, the waters began to part. So you can imagine the relief. And so he heads across, and his people follow, and then all the other tribes follow suit. Of course, they get to the other side, and, uh, and Moses turns around, raises his staff again, <laughs> and once all his people are clear, the Egyptians come racing in the chariots and, of course, the waters close in over them and they wipe out all the Egyptians not to be followed. So at that point in time, Greg, uh, they're safe and, uh, and Nashon's the first it's one incre in. It's an incredible story when you paint that sort of a picture, isn't it? Like, I remember going as a kid fishing and Dad would take us out pretty early in the morning fishing yeah. on a cold morning, but we used to have those waders that used to That's be over yeah. I don't imagine Nashon had any of those dungarees on when he went into the water first. That's right. What's interesting, though, Paul, what you just said then was the close relationship between Nashon and Aaron. You're saying that, so Moses and Aaron are the, really the key leaders of the whole nation of Israel That's coming right. out of Egypt, out of slavery after That's right. all of this time in slavery. And then um, you've got Nashon, who's the head of the head tribe yes. of Judah, yes. is actually the brother-in-law of, of, of Aaron. Aaron. You can imagine, right. you know, like, like in nowadays, you'd be over and having dinner at each other's place. Right. And all that. So exactly. It's not like some guy out there. This guy's pretty close to the family. That's, right. That's something that not everyone would have known. No, and the, and the, I think the interesting context is that here he is living in Egypt uh, and he's married into the family. And he's, you can imagine Aaron's being called by God to go and meet Moses. But um, Nashon wouldn't know Moses because he's been over in Midian for 40 years. Right. So suddenly he's waving goodbye to his brother-in-law and he's going off to meet Moses, this man who's actually going to lead them out of captivity. And he doesn't even know who he is or, or anything. I mean, it's not like, you know, we've got Skype or cell phones like we have today. So we have this situation where, where you know, there's, there's this, trust and these huge events that are happening and it's actually happening not just to them as a nation but it's happening to them very much personally uh, being called to responsibility uh, to actually lead these people and so uh, you know married into that family there's uh, <laughs> some real consequences <laughs> in, in leadership obviously for all of them. Well as far as they were concerned they were heading to whoop whoop which is an Australian term here but I noticed we've got Alan from whoop whoop yeah. so uh, <laughs> nice to have you Alan on board tonight and folks if you've got any questions for us wherever you are in the world just th throw some questions our way if you would like us to to try and answer those we're talking to Paul uh, about genealogy we're focusing on one guy Nashon which is uh, I must admit uh, I'm learning it a lot here myself tonight and enjoying that. Uh, also, our question for the night is, uh, can you name two women who are in the genealogy of Jesus and their occupations? Uh, see if you can remember that. So the Bible actually does have quite a big um, lot of, in, in the book of Matthew and in the book of Luke, the genealogy of Jesus, doesn't yes, he? Right. Now, is Nashon uh, listed down in that genealogy at all? So Nashon is listed in the, in the genealogy in the book of Matthew. Uh, but uh, he's he, uh, the excuse me, sorry. The uh, the book of Luke, the focus is actually different because uh, we see in that that it goes through all of the descendants, so it goes all the way from Jesus all the way back to Adam. Right. Uh, whereas in the book of uh, Matthew, it actually goes from Abraham through to Jesus. So their purpose is actually different. But Nashon being a descendant 
that's prior to the kings is actually in both of the genealogies. Is that right? Yeah. So, so um, okay, so they get into the, the, the wilderness now. Is Marshawn still, does he still play a part in the, in the journey? Right. So, so this is where it gets interesting because a lot of the time when we're reading the Bible, we're following the stories and the events that are happening and, and also the, the purpose in why they're happening and what, what the Lord's message is in it. But oftentimes these people are actually there and they're going through these very situations, but they're not actually uh, named. But we do know that they're actually there. So at this point in time, they go. it tells us in the Bible that they go from the Red Sea and they go down to Mount Sinai. And, of course, at Mount Sinai is where their nation was actually formed. So God left them in Egypt for a long time. And when you oppress people together, it gives them a common cause to fight for. You know, before they went, you might remember, that Joseph was actually uh, sent there to get rid of him because the brothers were jealous. So there was no way that a nation in Israel was going to form with a family that was actually fighting and lying and potentially trying to kill one of their own brothers. So after all these generations of this oppression, these people are put together firmly, but they don't really know the Lord a lot of these people because they're in a foreign country, they've got all these foreign gods, so they're not actually worshipping and following the Lord as a, as a, as a society, if you will. So when they actually come out and they go down to Mount Sinai, this is where God steps in and says, okay, now I'm going to make you my nation. So what he does is he not only uh, uh, invites Moses to come up the mountain there and he gives him the commandments, uh, and not just the 10 that we read about uh, in, in, in most uh, literature or stories, but there's actually 613 commandments in total that were actually given. But the, the Bible focuses on the 10 main uh, commandments that he comes down the mountain with. So when he comes down, when he goes up and down the mountain and the tablets are broken, we've got a story that actually eventuates around that. And part of what happens is that um, when, when the Bible talks about who goes up and down the mountain, there's a time when the Bible keeps speaking about 70 leaders or elders. And these people are actually, uh, those people, for example, are Nashon. He's one of the leaders. He leads the largest tribe. So when those events are described in the Bible as 70 leaders, we know that Nashon was actually participating in all those things. So when the staff and the, uh, uh, was hit against the rock, when they were heading to Mount Sinai and they were complaining of starving, uh, sorry, of being thirsty, and the rock was uh, uh, hit to reveal the water that happened twice, at this point in time, Nashon was actually there. You know, when, when he went up the mountain, uh, when the leaders were called up the mountain, they... He, Uh, a little Aaron and Moses went across uh, to 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 be beside him uh, on the throne, but Nashon was actually sitting there, actually uh, eating and drinking with God Himself. Incredible. On that so, are, are we talking about that the the, the scripture there where the, there's the sapphire and the stones? Correct. And, and they were actually there supping with the Lord, Absolutely. and Nashon. He's right there, right there with them. What a the thank you. So there he is, but he's, you know, he's brother-in-law to uh, uh, to Aaron, and he's up there with him, and uh, and and with with uh, Aaron's brother Moses as well. So you know, a bit of a family affair going on up there as well as all the other. <laughs> well, I see Brett's just Those joined us leaders. too, and and uh, good day, Brett. It's lovely to see you there, Brett. Day, Brett. Pastor Brett. Um, so if you've got any questions, just uh, throw them at us, um, and don't forget our original questions. Who are the two women? We're going to reveal that at the end. So hopefully before the end of this, you'll have known. Okay, so they're up the mountain. The law has been given. Yeah. Um, and, of course, the instructions for the tabernacle and all that sort of thing. Sure. Is there any other mention of this incredible guy? Yeah, so when, when the laws are given, we have a situation where uh, Moses came down. Uh, the first time, this is before he went up with the 70. And uh, he, he comes back down the mountain. And of course, they formed the golden calf. So Nashon's actually there when this happens. So when Moses comes down, uh, you may remember the story, he breaks the tablets in his anger, and then the, the Levites are called uh, to stand, and they actually go, and there's 3,000 people that are actually killed, but Nashon wasn't actually killed. And, and so how do we know that? How do we know that he didn't participate? And we know that because when, when the, uh, the tabernacle and the priesthood were being formed, this is when God is truly uh, imprinting his people and saying, these are my laws, this is your priesthood, and this is where you will come to worship me. So this is a big moment. This is the forming of the nation of Israel. This is the very beginning 
where they actually become the nation of Israel rather than people who are descendants of Abraham. Mm. And it's a major significant event, which obviously goes right through to today. And so, so at this point in time, when this happens, there's a range of things that occur. And one of them is actually the priestly robes and the breastplate and the ephod, all these different uh, uh, garments that are actually put to honour the priests of God. And, uh, and what happens is, is that uh, Nashon is actually named in the Bible and he actually, he actually gives uh, uh, an onx, so it's a type of, uh, of stunner, and that actually becomes part of the actual breastplate, and he gives some other goods as well. So there's that side of it, and then they're actually called to, to, the, uh, to the tabernacle. So again, as the leader, he's called. So when, when the Lord came and descended on the tabernacle, the fount, he was there as well. There was the time when Moses was struggling, and he was uh, asking for some help. So... The, the spirit that was given to Moses was also put upon the 70 leaders. Mm. Um, so the Holy Spirit, you know, there was that impartation of the Holy Spirit at that time to Narshon as well. So Narshon had this incredible journey at this point in time. Um, he, after they actually leave there to sort of uh, wrap up his journey, he actually uh, doesn't make it into uh, the land of Canaan. So his son Salmon, or Salma as it's sometimes called, uh, he makes it into the land, and when the t the spies actually uh, go into the country uh, of uh, t of Canaan to have a look uh, within a couple of years, uh, it actually says that he's actually not one of those leaders at that point in time. So we we don't know exactly when he passed away, but we know he had this incredible journey, um, but he wasn't one of the ones who was going to actually make it into the land of Canaan. One of the reasons was is because of the worship of the golden calf. You know, there was that anger uh, that came, that, that lack of reverence for God while Moses was up at the top of the mountain. So, yeah, fascinating story. Absolutely. I tell you, that's like that red Hyundai. Now, people are going to be reading the Bible now and looking for Narshon. Yep. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, his son, you mentioned Salmon, uh, went in there. And Salmon, Salmon actually has something to do with the question I asked a little bit earlier. Right. I've noticed Alan's come back with an answer, but I, I'm not sure if he's got it right. He said Ruth um, motorbike or something like that, and Rahab a prostitute. But um, uh, any any last guesses as to? I, I think Alan, you've pretty well got it right there. But um, interestingly enough, the two women that were in the genealogy of Jesus were, of course, Ruth the Moabite, yeah. who married Boaz. Yes. Um, and here's the connection: Salmon. The son of Nashon yep. ends up marrying Rahab yep. from Jericho, yes. who is a Canaanite. And not only that, her occupation was she was a harlot or a prostitute. Right. So here's this, and, and they're, they're, they, they had a child named Boaz who married the other woman, Ruth, yes. the Moabite. So there was two generations that intermarried, yep. and they were warned before they went in not to intermarry. <laughs> it's quite incredible, isn't it? And there's a point here, I think, that's very important. Paul, is that in the genealogy of the Messiah, Jesus, there's all, this, there's all these broken people. Right. And it's, it's very heartening, isn't it, that, um, that even in that genealogy, there's imperfection yep. in the sense of uh, Jesus has come into our mess. Right. He's come into the mess of humanity right. as our Messiah and our Saviour. Yep. And he's there to rescue people from that. And, and it's another thing to say is it doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done in your life, there is hope because Jesus, our Messiah, Jesus, um, is here to mend the brokenness and forgive the, the, the muck-ups and sin and all of that uh, that we have done in our own life. And his own genealogy is even a testament to that. Um, and, and, of course, the fact that in that scripture I read earlier, it says in, in, you, in, my, in that seed, all the nations, all the generations shall be blessed. Um, and as Paul says, we, by faith in Jesus as the Messiah, have become sons of Abraham, right. or we have become part of the inheritance. And, and the yes. significance is that it's not about bloodline, mm. because if you actually look at the pathway of the descendants through to Jesus, the bloodline is broken as well. Right. So it's not a pure bloodline descendancy from Abraham, as oftentimes people think. Um, but that's the whole point. You know, Jesus came... When he's being persecuted and, and and questioned about was he the son of God, he would always always answer and say, "I am the son of man." 
he came here to represent us to the Father. Yeah. So he distinguishes himself as, as uh, you know, obviously divine, but also as human. And as a human person, there's that brokenness in his very past in the same way that we have as well. So hence, hence the alignment that he can have with us. Yes, it's a very good point. I see Alan again. He's a Bible scholar. Alan, we had him on the program a few weeks ago. We did, didn't we? And uh, left him a bit speechless at one point. But uh, he, he rightly says, no, Ammonite or Moabite may, or any of their descendants for 10 generations may be admitted into the assembly of the Lord. It's incredible that Ruth and, 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 and um, Rahab yes. are actually in that genealogy. Well, our time is uh, sadly up already. And... Uh, uh, Paul, we found that absolutely fascinating. Thank you for the huge amount of study that you've done. Um, and, of course, you're producing this this book. I believe you've been working on it for about 67 years. Uh, but we are, <laughs> looking, genealogy, <laughs> <laughs> we are looking forward to that book coming Maybe out. This generation will actually get the credit. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, it's been great to be with you tonight. And thank you for joining us on uh, good, the Good News for Israel show. And please continue to make comments as this will be posted on our uh, Facebook page and you will be able to make comments, ask questions and if you'd like us to talk on a particular subject we would just love to do that as well alright well it's it's going to be bye bye for us for now but perhaps you do you want to close us in prayer sure. again Paul? Absolutely, let's pray Dear Heavenly Father, Lord we just thank you for this night, we just uh, pray, you know it's such a blessing to discuss uh, the richness of the Bible and the people that were in it Lord and they all had a purpose and I just pray that through this uh this message that you know we look at the genealogy of jesus it's like a skeleton it's like a framework for the bible of the people at the time but we too are part of that body and uh and we're not we're not separated from jesus and that blessing that comes from from this very genealogy it talks about from the time of abraham through to jesus so those descendants lord that brought jesus uh, to come and uh, die on that cross and save us lord so we just give thanks for that grace and that plan that you had that that perfect plan that was set so long ago in order that we could be set free today. So we just give thanks mm. uh, for what you've done for us and this immense journey that we can read for ourselves in the Word of God in the Bible, Lord. We Thank just you. give you thanks that we can understand that to this day and understand that you know there's a blessing and a benefit for us in that too. So we just give thanks for this time and good news for Israel and we uh, just pray that you've enjoyed this uh, this segment and, uh, and I also pray that you've been able to to learn something so we just give thanks in jesus name amen amen thanks so much paul and god bless you everybody and until next week bye for now good night